Hello, everyone, and thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us tonight for this session of the Bison Transport Sport Leadership Series, Find Your Place in Sport. My name is Anastasia Busis, and I will be your host this evening and throughout the rest of the series. I can't believe that we've done three of these already. Uh, mark your calendars, February 12th. That is our final session. It's going to be amazing. I've had just such a blast uh, partaking in these conversations. If I've not met you, um, once upon a time, I was a long track speed skater. I was really, really lucky to have a 24 year career. I uh, skated in a few Olympics. And now I work for CBC Sports where I host a podcast called Players Own Voice, which is very human first, athlete second, and um, diligently planning for Paris 2024, which seems wild because Beijing was just, <laughs> just a year ago, but we're almost in Paris. And this topic, of course, finding your place in sport is close to my heart because sport has been the gift that has kept on giving in my life. And through transition, you, you do wonder, you know, what's my new place? Uh, and I love engaging with the community. So I know that we're gonna have a fantastic conversation this evening. This series brings together inspirational leaders from all areas of sport to tell their personal and professional stories. They offer valuable advice and guidance and share practical tips that participants can use on and off the field of play. Sport Manitoba would like to begin by acknowledging the land on which we work, live and play are the traditional lands and waterways of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples, as well as the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties made here and are grateful to work, live and play on this land. Sport Manitoba values and welcomes the opinions of all participants and strives to offer a safe space where respect for speakers and guests is always maintained. Welcome, welcome, welcome again to all our attendees and in particular our friends at Bison Transport. We're excited to have you all with us tonight. It's going to be a great conversation, I promise. Uh, we've already had some fun backstage. Sport Manitoba, in partnership with Bison Transport, aspire to increase female engagement in sport by providing an informative, inclusive and inspirational experience through this series. Uh, just a quick housekeeping, few housekeeping rules before we get started. If you're having issues with the stream, click on, click here to refresh stream under the video player to view our alternate stream. So there is an alternate stream. And um, if you're having any technical issues, click on the help button on the top right corner of the webcast page and uh, make sure you're monitoring, monitoring the, the email that you actually registered to participate with because the help will be emailed back to the email address you pr provided when registering. Uh, and lastly, throughout tonight's session, we encourage you to ask questions using the question box on the right-hand side of the webcast. Engage on social media, whether that be Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, whatever platform you're using, please tag Sport Manitoba and use the hashtag lead her ship. This is all about you. I want to make this as conversational and interactive as possible. There will be time at the end for questions. So please, please, please send us your questions. I know we all have a little screen burn out. So we really appreciate that you're here joining us for this great conversation. And with that, let's get started with our uh, guests this evening and let's meet them right now. Hello, my name is Jordan. I am a maintenance assistant with Bison Transport. Lisa Tinley has always had a love for sport, starting at an early age. Sport played an important role in her life and she knew her profession would involve working in sport in some capacity. She graduated from the University of Manitoba in 1998 with a degree in recreation management and started working at the Canadian Sports Centre Manitoba, which was located on campus at the time. The unique opportunity had Lisa working with a national sport organization during the Pan Am Games primarily to promote Manitoban athletes and coaches. She then went on to work with the Western Canada Summer Games, Special Olympics, Manitoba Liquor and Lotteries, and now, along with her current role with Bison Sports and Recreation Services, owns her own business. In each position Lisa held, there was always a connection to sport, and it's a key component for keeping her passion alive for the job. In her non-professional life, she has been married to Glenn for the past 28 years and has two teenage boys that give her a run for her money each day. Janine Stevens finished her competitive rowing career with a silver medal in the Women's 8 Plus at the 2012 London Olympic Games. Since then, Janine moved back to Winnipeg and moved into the role of president of the Winnipeg Rowing Club. 
In the time spent back in the sport and rowing community in Winnipeg, Janine realized she had a real passion for coaching and helping athletes reach their full potential, and in turn took on the role of head coach for the Manitoba Rowing Association in May of 2017. Janine has a very hands-on learning approach for her athletes, which is helpful for her as she works to improve her coaching abilities. Feeling the athletes' movements in the boat and their tendencies can be helpful both for the athletes and for Janine, as she is constantly thinking about what she does and or thinks about during the stroke. She can then relay that to the athletes with another variation on how they can better learn and grow as rowers. Janine has had a very positive effect on the rowing community and athletes in Manitoba. As she continues down the coaching path, she hopes she can grow the sport and help many more athletes achieve what she never even dreamed she could. Donna Harris is a chartered professional coach and skilled leader with specific experience in large-scale program development and implementation. She holds a Master of Arts in Kinesiology. Her thesis explored the impact of passion on the performance and lives of Olympic and Paralympic coaches and their partners. The outcome of Donna's research led to workshops focusing on sustained performance where these sessions are delivered through the Own the Podium Pursuit program and in corporate settings. The architect behind Athletics Canada's revised coaching education program, she understands the components of performance and the steps necessary to draw out the best in everyone. Donna worked in amateur sport for 20 years in various leadership roles, including the Director of Coach Development at Athletics Canada and Executive Director of Athletics Manitoba and Racquetball Canada. In 2020, she moved from sport to the corporate sector and is currently a founding team member at HumanWise, a startup that embraces the crazy idea that professional development is not a one-size-fits-all solution. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, 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 Donna, Lisa, and Janine. We're going to have a great evening. I know it. Um, let's start off with an easy one. How did you get involved in sport? And when did you know this is exactly where I should be? This is, is exactly what I should be doing. Lisa, let's start with you. Sure. Thanks. Uh, good question. I would say I've always had a love for sport and that I knew I would somehow weave it into what I was going to do. I grew up in a house where my mom was a teacher. We grew up in a small town and sports was, we, we did it all the time. Um, it was kind of the thing that everybody got together on the weekends and if it was baseball, soccer, like it was every sport. And so I just knew that that's what I wanted to do. Uh, when I graduated high school, after playing all the sports, I uh, did my arts degree because I didn't really know the path that I wanted to do. Um, I can honestly say that I squeaked through by the skin of my teeth. Um, I remember getting a call from a professor saying, yeah, I have some bad news. You got a D in biology. And I'm like, yes, I made it. <laughs> so I, I did my arts degree and um, my now husband was working for the running room and um, we, he got a job offer to Kelowna to move to Kelowna to open the running room store there. And so we had always, um, like every weekend running room was doing a race. And I knew that I loved just being part of that culture. And um, so we moved to Kelowna and again, putting on races, we started a marathon and I knew that this is what I wanted to do for a living. I just didn't know how, how was I going to like make money off of this? This was part of what my husband was doing. Um, it, it was his career, but how was I going to do that? And then um, Mike Mann uh, was someone I ran into. He was uh, one of the professors at U of M. I, I met him at a, a race out in Jasper, and he was telling me about the Rec Studies program. And I, I had no idea what it was, but he just said it would be a pathway for you to work in sport. And so that's, um, I knew I had the love for sport and then suddenly I had a mechanism for how to make it my career. And so I ended up uh, doing a rec studies degree and I, um, at U of M, and then I did a placement as part of the rec studies program. Uh, there's lots of different avenues you can go down. And I was really lucky because I graduated in 98 and the Pan Am Games were happening. And I did my placement at the at then at the National Sports Center, Manitoba. And Alec Gardner was um, head of the program and it was brand new. They didn't even have office space, nothing. And I ran into him and he's like, you need to come and do your placement with us. 
And so I did. And when I showed up the first day, they had, they didn't have a desk for me. They didn't even know what to do with me. And it was in the old sport Manitoba building at 200 main. And I walked in and they just, they knew their mission. They knew that they were going to support high performance athletes. And, and I just figured out how I could fit in and, and it was the best experience. And it kind of launched me into my career. I feel very lucky to have that, uh, to have had that experience. Very cool. Donna, how, how did you get into sport? And when were you like, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing? Uh, well, it's sort of funny <laughs> because of the one degree of separation in Winnipeg. I also did my rec placement at the Canadian Sports Center and Lisa was the person that I reported to. <laughs> and, um, so but, but before that, so which and that really hooked me because of the culture that Alec and his team and Lisa was a big part of that created um, created there and the opportunity to see what goes on behind the scenes to support high performance athletes and to be part of that system was really inspiring and um and really incredible but before that i was involved in sport in in high school and uh was an athlete a track and field athlete and i i had to make a decision in high school between sport and music actually which is an odd combination and i chose to follow my heart at the time and my rationale was well you know when, when you're broken from doing sport i mean like you know because i you get injured then you can always sit at the piano so let's go and do this sport gig so i also did a rec degree at u of m just like lisa and um and then really that experience at the canadian sports center uh, solidified the the will or the interest that I had in working in sport and then I had the opportunity to to move on and work for coaching Manitoba and then on to Athletics Canada where I continued to work with Alec Gardner he was my mentor coach and um, when I was coaching and he was also a, a really strong mentor uh, at Athletics Canada and uh, threw me in over my head all the time, but never let me drown, right? I'm sure Lisa, you can relate to that, right? Like that, no, you can do this. And you're like, no, I really don't think I can. No, nope. right? And so as I, I know we'll get to this later, but as leaders, I think that's really important is to challenge people. And so I was lucky throughout my career to have um, leaders and mentors around me who created opportunities and allowed me to be challenged, but never let me be too far away from that, you know, within arm's reach so to speak. So I yeah. uh, definitely came through the pathway of being an athlete. I competed at the University of Manitoba and, and had some experience with event management and was really interested in, in that part of it. But the experience at the Canadian Sports Centre that um, really exposed me to the broader sports system and the different roles that you can have in the sports system in terms of, you know, we always know about coaches and athletes, but we often don't know about the incredible job that there's tons of support um, uh, around the system that helps athletes get to where they go. And those jobs are just as rewarding, but sometimes they're just not as visible. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And cool. uh, yeah, so that was my, uh, that's my story. Cool. I, I, I uh, grew up in Calgary, so I was more obviously hands-on with CSI Calgary, but I had a very similar experience. So it's really cool to hear your, uh, yeah. your experience. Janine, you obviously had a formidable career. Um, certainly, you know, was there a moment when you thought, wow, like, Really, I'm going to take this to the top and hopefully uh, on the podium at the Olympics one day. Uh, no, actually, I had no idea. <laughs> That's a perfect answer. That's perfect. I, I was totally not the person that was going to go to the Olympics from when they were six years old onwards. In fact, the year that I was graduating, the national team coach came down. I was at Michigan, came down to talk to the team the Canadians that were there, I think there were nine of us at the time. And I went into this meeting being like, well, he's here for these two people, not for me, but I'll go to the meeting because I have to and left the meeting and still thought he was not there to talk to me. And then one of the other girls said, well, I think I'd like to go to this tryout, but I need a partner. And I'm like, no. <laughs> Fast forward a month, I said yes. And um, yeah, then at that point it was like we were invited to the next steps the next steps I actually raced on like the development team at the Fizu games um in 2006 and then quit rowing <laughs> because I thought I raced for Canada once I got the jersey I'm out <laughs> um and then I got sucked back in for more so uh did yeah 2008 seven, 2007 to 2012 with the national team and when I finished like 
every person, oh, are you going to coach? Are you going to coach? I'm like, I don't know how to coach. I, I don't even watch rowing. I, I row, but I, I don't watch it. Like I can't correct someone. I can't do anything. And then in 2014, we were like Manitoba was between coaches. And so I did some filling in two afternoons a week with six month old twins and was like taking the bus home from practice. And my mom was picking me up. I'm like 31 with kids and my mom's still picking me up at the boat house like years later. Um, and then still, and then I didn't start actually coaching until like 2017. I was just helping out in the off time, but I just, um, it was actually my husband that said, obviously coaching brings you such joy. This is like, you should explore this. Oddly enough, uh, Lisa Tinley was my <laughs> boss for the job that overlapped between the Olympics and starting coaching. <laughs> so, <laughs> Lisa is like the glue here. I love it. <laughs> but I love your candor, right? Like, I think yeah. so many people think that Olympians dream of going to the Olympics when they're four. And I just love that answer that you're so honest. Yeah. Do you mind? What was your relationship to sport when you retired? Like, you said, okay, I didn't want to coach, but did you kind of entertain being a, still a part of the ecosystem? Because I know a lot of athletes are like, I need to take a break. Yeah, I think what benefited me was I left rowing uh, with a really positive like experience. Sport to me was great. Um, I left because my real dream in life was to be a mom. And I had a teammate going into the Beijing Olympics in 2008, and she was trying to parent and had kids. And I just watched that experience. And although she was incredible and did it and was amazing, I just was like, I don't want that for myself. Like she would get up and drop her kid off at the babysitter so she could get to practice and then pick it up, feed the kid, put him down for nap and then drop him back off. Like She only had it for like lunch and nap time. And I said, like, I just, I want to be more present than that as best I can. And um, I've been really thankful that I've had jobs that have allowed for that presence. And so um, I loved rowing. I raced. I mean, I rowed through my pregnancy as long as I could until someone commented how the boat looked really tippy and I wasn't rowing well. And I'm like, well, I can't get up to my full catch where I'm used to and I can't I keep hitting myself in the stomach at the back end so like I guess I'm done because I don't know <laughs> and I was like devastated because there's so many people who row through their entire pregnancy and like can somehow make it work but at that point I didn't know I was pregnant with twins and so <laughs> once I was told that I was like okay well at least there might be a reason for yeah. my <laughs> inability to exercise and a state of exhaustion so yeah <laughs> I well I, I mean you have two beautiful twins now so it's all it's all perfect yeah. Yeah. um so I mean we touched upon how everyone got involved in sport at a professional level what advice would you give to women right now that kind of say I really want to make this a career uh Donna let's start with you hmm um I think it would it would dep it depends on the the pathway into sport is often idiosyncratic. And so we talk about that with coaches, right? Janine's story about, well, I, I don't want to be a coach or I don't know how to coach. And so many coaches land, not that coaching is the only job, but I'll just start there. So many coaches land in a coaching job, never expecting to be there. And this is a consistent story when you talk to coaches at the Canada Games level or at the Olympic level and Paralympic level, right? It's, oh, well, they needed a coach. So I signed up and then I found out that I loved it or the school team, needed a coach and I found out that I loved it and I found out I was good at it. So I followed this pathway. And so I think um, if you want to have a career in sport, identify the elements of sport that you're passionate about or the special talents that you bring. So, you know, if you, if you come with technical expertise, then that's probably, that's a good pathway for you. But if you come with communications and marketing expertise, or you come with financial expertise, or you come with a skill set. I mean, sport is just like any other business. We need all of those talents and all of those skill sets. And so um, I think it would be to, if you already have an established career, recognize those skill sets that you have that every sport association and every team needs. Um, and then sometimes you have to start at a volunteering or, you know, getting engaged and in, in showing yourself within the sport community, like a, as, as having interest. Um, and then, you know, and then it's like any, any job applying for those jobs, but relationships are key. 
uh, demonstrating uh, your knowledge and, and ability, regardless of whether that's sport technical or non-sport technical. I think sometimes we may think that sport is, oh, I have to have come from an athlete background or I have to know the technical nuances. And there are jobs like that, but there's far more that happen off the field of play that support performance um, and support athletes and coaches in their quest for excellence. And when I say that quest for excellence, I mean at any level, right? I think, um, and I coach now again at the grassroots level, and we talk about showing up and doing your best for that day and finishing what you start. And I think that's what I mean when I say quest for excellence. So whether you're working at the provincial level or the national level, or whether you're working with high performance athletes, that nuance of bringing your best and doing your best every day um, is is consistent. So um, yeah, exposure, knowing your talents. And then I think on the, I can't, my expertise lies in work-life blend. <laughs> so I'd also say, know your boundaries and know your values. So that, um, because uh, sport will take all you're willing to give. And if you don't know where the line in the sand is, it can get you into trouble. And I don't mean that as a negative. I'm speaking from life experience, right? And so yeah. um, I would say if you know your values and and know where your lines in the sand are, then you'll be set up for success. Because uh, not knowing that requires some hard learning that um, we can talk about later if you want. <laughs> well, so let me follow up. No, it, it, because you've done your master's in the subject, passion, purpose, boundaries, being keys mm -hmm. to success in sport. Um, can you just expand a little bit on that? Like, what are the main takeaways that you wish people knew, you know, that perhaps are mm -hmm. heading into a profession in sport? Uh, Janine and Lisa, please jump in at any time. Yes, you obviously, this is a conversation. <laughs> significant lived experience in this area also. Um, so I think to go back to what I said before is, is recognizing that when you come to sport, often all of us are wired for passion. And that passion is, I always, I talk about it now in terms of like, it's your jet fuel or it's your kryptonite. So you want to, you want to make sure you're, you're fueling yourself with jet fuel and you're staying away from the kryptonite because passion is required from us in order for us to do the extraordinary things that are required in order to be successful in sport, whether regardless of the level you're working at, if you're passionate about it, you're going to give the extra mile without even thinking about it. We have to think about it. <laughs> so, um, because if you don't, uh, we can get ourselves into trouble. And so our greatest strength, which is passion for the people we work with and the work that we do can also be our greatest weakness in terms of our inability to step away, to disconnect, to recognize that sometimes we need to put ourselves first so we're able to best serve the people around us. Um, and to recognize that this is, comes from the coach research, but I think it applies to, to many roles in sport is that um, passion you know, drives us and gets us across the finish line and helps us be successful. But you also often carry this weight, this sense of incredible responsibility for the athletes and coaches that you may be responsible for, or if you're a coach, the responsibility for that athlete performance. And so I think just acknowledging and recognizing that and sort of being able to have an awareness uh, of it can help us to negate it properly and negate it, not, not properly, that's a terrible use of words, um, can negate it better. So if we're aware that passion's gonna drive us and we're gonna go the extra mile, then understanding where your boundaries are and maybe having a buddy who can sort of, cause you're not always open to like feedback when you're <laughs> driving for success, right? So like maybe you're doing too much, like is generally say that to a coach very carefully. Um, because you won't but their children, it. their children will say it to them. No problem. Their Mom, children will have, yeah. The age, the age is eight year old, eight years old. They have no problem saying, mom, you like your athletes more than us. Oh, <laughs> oh. got it. All right. So yeah. we'll make a change this weekend. <laughs> I'll see you then. <laughs> so yeah. Janine your son might say, uh, can we start making dinner again? <laughs> oh. <laughs> So why are we using the slow cooker all the time? No. I, you know what? I'm guilty of that as well. Slow cooker all winter. Um, oh. Janine, do you, so how does that like resonate with you? I mean, you're coaching now balance and passion. Like what does your process look like? Um, I think it sucks me in every once in a while, which is like hard because I love it. So it doesn't bother me. But then at a certain point when my children are on me, uh, less my husband, he doesn't get, he like is very supportive and I'm super lucky to have him because when I'm gone, he's on duty, right? I was gone for three and a half weeks in September, Canada games was in the summer. 
I was coaching that. I was gone, I think, six of eight weekends in May, June this year. And so it was just a lot of um, childcare and balancing and husband parenting duties. Uh, which is fine, but it just, we have to do a lot of planning in advance before it happens. So I think like finding that balancing act, um, planning ahead, Donna's taught me a lot about like not just looking the week ahead, which I totally do on calendars every week, but like actually a few weeks ahead so that you know what's coming and maybe we can do more now to alleviate some of the stress later. Um, and I think that that's just like a helpful tool, like looking into the future. We know that our spring is always crazy. My husband's busy. I'm busy. Um, and so just trying to sort of get ahead of that a little with the meal planning idea, getting things in the freezer that we can just thaw and then cook quickly instant pot. We love in our house, slow cooker, same. Um, but it's just like planning for those things has been, I think our lifesaver for us and then just really being okay with asking for help like I have my parents friends like my godparents have been a huge help for us like we really have expanded our network of um people to help us and if someone could invent uber for children to get them <laughs> to their activities so I can get a young babysitter who doesn't drive to help still get that would be what I'm looking for for uh or the spring like <laughs> that's a billion dollar idea <laughs> um lisa and we can continue of course talking about balance so please again jump in uh, this is just a conversation but um i'd love to touch upon your education and how that helped kind of shape your career path and the lessons sure. you learned there for sure the one thing i will say uh when when donna talked about balance i'm terrible at it and I will say, because I was, I'm, I'm passionate about sport, I truly believe in, in what it brings to not only individuals, but the skills that people develop because of sport, it sucks me in. And so I, I tend to give a lot and um, I'm still trying to manage that balance piece. But um, if, I, if I look back at my education um, at U of M and, and rec studies, you know what, it, it really prepared me because it gave me a sense of what part of sport I wanted to be involved with because there's there's other pathways in, in rec. Um, but I, I knew I wanted to be also part of the community development side of things as well. And so I was lucky in that um, during my degree, I got to do uh, a research project with Jack Harper, who was one of my um, professors. And it was on the privatization of amateur sports and and you know the bringing in sponsorship to pay for sport because it's just chronically underfunded the only time we ever really see a lot of investment is during olympic years and when we're hosting an olympics and so i've always said to corporations athletes do not need your support six months before an olympics they need it six years before they they need to eat and train and and that's when they need you standing by their side but i would say that um, that the privatization um, project really set the tone for me in because I went the marketing communications fund development stream. And so I got the chance um, to go when I was with the National Sports Center and Canadian Sports Center to build. I started a, we started a scholarship fund. We did fundraising events to send athletes off to the Olympics to welcome them back and really entrench them in the community. So the community felt responsible for and and, and shared in the success and sometimes the heartbreak of those athletes. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, uh, there was event planning as part of my, my degree, uh, strategic planning, all of that. And so for me, I did a, a minor in uh, marketing. And so that really gave me the skills necessary to, to have a career in sport. And like Donna said, you can have a variety. It can be finance. It can be, you know, you're the nutritionist, the biomechanist, the sports psychologist. Like there's so many different ways to lift athletes up and be involved in sport. You just have to take your talent and bring it to the team. And, uh, and yeah, you can, you can have a, a, a career in sport for sure. I like what Donna said about like when you can just sort of it might be a volunteer role or you might be able to just get involved in something but yeah. if you have the talent you can find the gaps yeah. and yeah. like that is those gaps that 
people usually within the organization either might not notice or don't know how to fill them. But if you can see that and offer to fill the gaps, like that's huge. No, is a brilliant answer. And I love how you touch upon just how many facets of sport are out there and available that people don't even really think of, you know, like you said, community marketing, like it just goes on and on and on. So if we could play a game, let's pretend like we don't live the lives that we live, but if you could do it all over again, is there another area of sport that you'd like to part participate in? Or is there another area that you would like to give a little, I, I don't know, a love to like, Hey, remember that this is out there, Lisa. Oh, I would do sports psychology for sure. Yeah. Um, I think it's it's kind of the crutch that every every athlete needs to lift them up or to help pick them up. And um, you know, the tools to to become stronger and help you deal with victory and deal with defeat, that that would be the piece that that I would I would definitely do. Uh Donna or Janine. You want, I can go, Janine, if you want. Okay. We're both like staring at each other. Um, <laughs> I would, the sports psych for sure. I think given the work that I've done recently, I think that would have been a really uh, awesome avenue to go on. And then as a little bit of an aside to that question, <clears throat> I would have had more confidence in my ability as a coach and I wouldn't have questioned myself so much. And I think if I had, um, <clears throat> my husband always tells me like, when you question the people who are telling you that they believe in you, then you're, you know, you're compromising their reputation. So don't compromise their rep reputation, believe them. And so it's a very <clears throat> helpful piece of advice. Um, I clearly didn't take it as early as I should have, but um, so I think that the, I, I would have the going down the sports psych route for sure. Um, definitely, but I, I would have believed in myself when other people were telling me that I should have. And I think that's a common challenge for, um, for women in particular, right? And so I would say, uh, don't be afraid to explore something if you think it's interesting, like take the shot, do the exploration, you know, volunteer or just give it a try because you never know where it's going to go. And, you know, believe in yourself because someone has to do it. So why not you, right? Is that, isn't that a, someone's quote, it's not mine, but those that's would be my, my answer. Your, your reframe about, um, jeopardizing their uh, reputation though that's that is brilliant because i am so guilty of that i'm like no no i can't accept a compliment ever so that's yeah. really that's really yeah. a good learning uh, well, that's, i would that's, love Ty, that's not me i have that's my husband well your <laughs> husband is very yeah. smart i'd love yeah. to meet him yeah that's a, that's brilliant Janine, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, well i i think like what i love about what i'm currently doing is just like having an impact on people's lives when they're in that sort of teenage young adult years um and so some role in that I really just enjoy sort of I don't know they get their driver's license and they graduate high school and they start university all sort of when they're working with me and I think just seeing the change from when they first start to when they leave and their growth as both an athlete and just an overall human in that time um I think I'm super fortunate to just have that opportunity so if there's another one that I could do that's not coaching but still get to work with them I think I'm pretty lucky so pretty happy doing that so let's talk about mentorship then I I, I give this question to the floor um first and foremost tips for people that would like to find a mentor uh, because that can be a little daunting and and um, scary to be honest. And what relationship would you like to see all women have with their mentors? Um, Don, I know you've done a lot of work with this, so I'll, I'll pass it to you at first. Um, I think so when you're looking for a mentor, I think it's important to recognize if you're looking for someone to support and guide or challenge, because those are two very different relationships and two different roles. And sometimes Sometimes it's an all-in-one deal. Um, so I, I've already referenced Alec Gardner, and he could do all of those things sometimes simultaneously, uh, support, guide, and challenge. But so I think be aware of, of what you want to get out of the relationship um, would be uh, one piece. And then to have that, that, uh, that discussion with your mentor, like, you know, how are we going to 
work together? Um, what do we want to achieve from this? Or how do we want to work? How do we want to work together? Um, and then it, I think having a sense of um, where you want to go and why you'd like to work with a mentor. So sometimes, like when I worked with Alec early on, it was very much a technical, you know, coaching development um, relationship. And then as I got to know him better, it became much more of a, um, like a, a guide or a sort of more of a, I don't want to say mature relationship, but sort of collegial relationship. So I think, yeah, understanding what you would like to get out of it and the way you'd like to work with your mentor and having that conversation with your mentor so that it's meaningful for both of you and um, and a good, not, I don't want to say a good use of everyone's time because that sounds negative, but you know, so that it's, um, that it is, that it's, because yeah. it's meaningful for mentors too, right? It's often, it's not a one-way relationship, it's a two-way relationship. And I think I always learn when I've had the opportunity to be in a mentor role, I learn from the people I'm working with all the time and hopefully it's beneficial for them too. So I don't, yeah, that's, yeah. Lisa, any uh, tips for folks that would like to uh, connect with a mentor? And do you have any anecdotes that, you know, uh, perhaps relate to a mentorship that have made a huge impact on your life? Yeah, I've, I've been really fortunate in that um, I've had three or four great mentors in my life. They happen to be um, bosses of mine. And I have learned so much from each. Each had a very unique style, um, but have had... A, just great relationships and respectful relationships and, and learn so much. And you realize that through each you've evolved, you've changed the job changes you as well. Um, the openness between you and, and, um, and your mentor is also important because you need to be open to suggestions. You need to be open to a different way of thinking, especially when that mentor challenges you. And when I was at liquor and lotteries, my boss challenged me every day. Like sometimes it really pissed me off, but I always like, I, I learned from it. And I, he, he knew exactly when to say, you know what, you're on the right path. You're doing the right thing. I'm just trying to push you to be, to do more, to be more, to think, think outside the box. And it, it's, um, it was, it was a rewarding experience. The one thing I will say is um, I would, I did some volunteer work uh, for the women's hockey world women's hockey championships in um, 2007. Mm -hmm. And I, I just want to speak to the like mentorship and connection and small community. So I, our chairperson was Polly Craig. She, um, I, I didn't know her um, before. Uh, she was a wonderful leader. Uh, she admitted she knew very little about hockey at the time, but was willing to, to learn from everybody there. And so she led us a, a whole team um, of volunteers through the delivering that event. And I will never forget the gold medal game. Um, we were carrying um, a tray of gold medals onto the ice and there was some like a military presentation. So there's these military guys dropping down from the ceiling and thank goodness, because we dropped the table with the gold medals and all the medals like went crashing to the, to the ice and they froze to the ice. So there we are like kicking these gold medals, trying no. to be like, <laughs> it was just a nightmare. And so go forward like eight or nine years and I go to work at Liquor and Lotteries and she is the chair of the board. Um, <laughs> and we're like, remember that time when we dropped the medals? And so you never know when someone's gonna reappear in your life in what capacity. And so I would the, probably, the best thing I can say is never be afraid to take advantage of an opportunity. It may not look like the dream job, the, the dream opportunity, but you never know what it's going to lead to and when you're going to have those periods of reconnection. So that's not really about men mentorship, but that is one little piece I wanted to get in there. Um, the gold medal story is like truly a nightmare. I mean, that's it probably a, a, mo a moment where you're thinking this could not be any worse. Yeah. Yeah, really? it, it couldn't get worse. It, it really couldn't. And I was just so grateful that there happened to be this military <laughs> people dropping from the ceiling that everybody is looking up while there's five of us just like furiously kicking the ice, like trying to like get these medals. Oh, yeah, 2007. <laughs> oh, um, Janina, I, I, I'm going to assume and tell me if I'm wrong, sorry, that you had uh, mentorship and mentors when you were 
you know, obviously rowing. And now that you're a coach, um, has that relationship changed at all to being a mentor to being a mentee? I'll tell you. So when I started coaching, I took over as the provincial coach or started as the provincial coach. So I didn't start and then work my way up through coaching. So I was pretty new to it. I uh, was super excited about it. Was really gung ho. Canada Games. We had to pick a team in six weeks. I had never run a selection, but I had been through selection. So I'm like, well, I know how this works. I'll just do what I always did, which was fine. But I will say that um, I started working at Liquor and Lotteries under Lisa, and there was like. 20 people on our team. We were at social events all the time and everything was really social. And then I started coaching and it was very lonely. It was just me. Um, I was only seeing my athletes during the day, which they are my favorite. They're wonderful people, but they're like not my close friends that I'm sharing my deepest thoughts with and or bouncing ideas or looking to them for life advice and stuff and so um, I would say my first two years were really lonely in like the coaching sphere because it was just me as a rowing coach um, and so I feel it, it took for me to reach out to like going to essentially to the rowing Canada conference meeting other rowing coaches Year two, I'm like, hey, can I get your phone number and maybe phone you if I have questions sometime like this super awkward um, thing? Because I did have questions, but I just didn't know other people who were coaching. My, my, the people I called were like the head national team coaches who coached me and I had their phone numbers, but it wasn't like other coaches who were other provincial coaches who were coaching at the same level for me. Um, so it was a really lonely road. And so I am on more of a mission to like, never let someone else feel that way. Yeah. So I think if you're in that position, you just call Susan Lambeau at coaching Manitoba and she gives you my number and we can go for coffee because if you are in that spot, I do not wish that on you. I started like in my life, once I recognized, I actually started journaling, which I don't do anymore. And I haven't done since, but I was like, what is wrong with me like I feel really out of sorts this isn't me and it took me a while to realize that in the summer everything was great and in the winter everything was a struggle and that's because in the summer there's way more activities we're at events we like there was just a lot happening and so that I was at the boathouse all day long working on boats and whatever and so that social piece for me as a extreme extrovert was covered and then in the winter go back to just seeing less people and less athletes and less overall activity at the boathouse. And so I just, it took me a couple of years to get to that place to recognize why I was feeling this way and things were kind of off. And so now I book like a lunch once a week with a friend or my mom or a cousin or whatever, just it works for me in that space. So I, I, now I just like to work with other people and encourage them, especially if they have kids, like encourage them to put their name out there and take the risk and your kids are going to be okay. They'll probably never remember. And if they do, they'll support you. They're excited about it and all of those things, but it seems super daunting at the time when they're little and you're leaving them and you're like, ah, yeah, they're fine. And, uh, and so I just like to try and encourage others and empower younger people who are getting into it. So hopefully they don't feel so isolated like I did. And it took, if I can save them two years of struggle, then that would be a win. Thank you for being vulnerable and thank you for doing that as an athlete and as someone now who is sometimes on TV, I feel lonely all the time. And I completely understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it just takes just honestly a coffee, just a yeah. quick chat with a friend and to, to realize and to remember that we were all in this together. Um, I want to go to audience questions in just a minute, but I'm going to um, let's end with a bang. So what message would you give to individuals uh, who are either in leadership positions right now or would like to become leaders in sport. Janine, Donna, and Lisa, we'll end with you. Um, what would I give message I give to people who are leaders? I think just use your position to help others. I think um, as women, we want to be cheering each other on and encouraging people to take the next step or apply for the job or put their name forward for various roles in various positions, even if it seems daunting. 
And I think, you know, if we can use social media to share stories of each other when we see success happening and, and really just use everything as a platform to help others and to get more women into sport, I think is if we can keep doing that. We're on the right path and sport will be in good hands. Donna? I think everything Janine said, um, plus as you were talking, I'm like, okay, what am I gonna say? Yeah, those are all like such good pieces of advice. I think um, sometimes when we get to leadership positions, we forget what it's like to really to want it so bad or to want to do a good job or to have that opportunity and so I think compassion and empathy always go a super long way in creating opportunities for people and um and supporting you know uh, other 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 women into into leadership roles and creating opportunities and I think sometimes as leaders we forget um forget the way that our voices are heard and forget I don't want to say the power that we have, but the influence perhaps that we have. And so I think it's always important to remember to use that influence um, to help bring uh, others along with you, uh, right? The more of us uh, that can learn from each other, the stronger we all shall be. And so, um, yeah, I think that mem that memory of, I'm not, I think the memory of how overwhelming it can be sometimes when you first stepping into maybe it's an assistant coach role or stepping into a leadership role or running an event for the first time right and when you've been doing it for 10 years it's like yeah it's a little bit it's a bit much but just follow the list and it's okay right and to step back into that memory of the very first time you did it I think can help us support others um, even in a more effective way to help to help them learn and to provide them with the support they need and to you know like I had done like arm's length so you can do this I'm going to watch you. I'm not going to let you drown. You're going to be okay. And I know it's scary and it's okay that it's scary, but you're going to have huge growth from this and you're going to become such an amazing leader from this experience. So um, yeah, that's all I have. Brilliant. Lisa? I would say that um, I would never want someone to not do something because they're afraid of making a mistake. I think the greatest learning comes from mistakes and I have way, made way more mistakes in my career and my job then I've done things right, but I have always had amazing leaders in my life that have, I've never, ever, um, you know, felt a consequence from that. It's always be, well, what did, what, what did you learn? And like Donna said, empowering people, that is how people grow and learn and, and take chances and take risks and you support them. And I remember what it was like walking into the national sports center. I was terrified and Alec and the entire team were just so good and welcoming. And yeah, we're going to do this together. And don't be afraid. Like, we're all going to learn from this and go and take a risk. And, and you know, you you lift people up. I'm a, I'm a big believer that you lift them up um, rather than, than bring them down. And that's how we all get to a better place and, uh, and have a better career and enjoy your career. You spend so much time. Um, don't be afraid to try things. Try everything. Try everything. All right, we're going to be right back with questions from the audience. But um, first, let's take a quick break with our title sponsor, Bison Trans Transport. What if you broke the mold? Didn't listen to all the things you were told. What if you really tried? Stood firm when they asked you why. What if you did what they said you couldn't? Achieved all the things they said you wouldn't? What if it didn't matter what they told you? What if you stood strong just to prove that you don't belong in the box they built you? How far could you go? How far could you go? How far could you go if you dare to be bold? Okay, we've got a few uh, audience questions and they are beauty. So let's dive head first. Uh, how have you worked to break the glass ceiling? Donna, do you want to start with this one? I, again, I'm just going to fire them out. This is, this is free for all now. I, so I, I don't know if I actively ever had that mindset, 
I think I just went after it and wanted to have the same, wanted to just get it done. And I, I, so I, I, I mean, not that there's not an awareness that a lot of times, most of the time I was the only woman at the table. I didn't even, I got to the point where I didn't even notice that I was the only woman in the room. I was so used to it. Um, coming from the sport of track and field and being at a leadership level in that sport, I, I, we had our CEO was female, but I often wasn't in meetings with her. And I think I had three other colleagues who were female and we often would see each other at training camps, but then very infrequently. So I don't think I ever thought about breaking the glass ceiling. I just thought like, I deserve to be at this table. And I, I mean, not to say that I didn't fight with insecurity because I absolutely did every single day. Absolutely. But um, I did think I just perseverance and, you know, I deserve to be here and I can do a good job. And um, I say this now with 20 years experience and I didn't know that time at the time, uh, at the time, right. When I was early in my career, but I was choosing what you listen to and what you don't. And so I made a conscious effort at that time to not be, it was just early. And there was this thing called tracky, which was, I think like chat around all things track and field. And I just made a conscious decision to never engage with it. Cause I didn't want to hear what people were saying about coaching. I didn't want to hear about what people might be saying about my athletes or about me as a female coach. So I just put, I guess, blinders on in that way, but I never really thought about breaking the glass ceiling. I just never really thought that it wasn't possible for me to be a, a head coach or a senior leader or a, uh, you know, anything else, but I mean, it's, Baker. it's a thing, right. Yeah. It's, it's certainly, it's certainly not the easiest path, <laughs> right. No, but definitely. I, I also have to acknowledge that I had, I was very fortunate to have people around me that opened doors instead of close them, which is, I think what we alluded to in the last, yeah. with the last question is what's the advice for leaders is that uh, it's probably less common 20 years ago than it is now. And I think there's way more women in leadership positions that can support other women. Um, and I had tremendous support from my male colleagues also, but um, yeah, I'm not gonna pretend that it's not there. I think I just never really thought about it and just part of my language, work my ass off to make sure that every opportunity that I could take was, was there um, and tried to work super hard, which had a downside to it, to not give anyone ever any reason to suggest that I wasn't capable. Mm -hmm. uh, now there's a downside to that, which is a whole separate podcast like <laughs> webinar, but you know, anyway, <laughs> we don't need to go there today, but be careful, like around the kryptonite jet fuel thing. That's really important, but yeah, okay. the glass ceiling is there, but it, it doesn't need to be something that, uh, cuts off your oxygen. I think that I, you know, like I'm not saying ignore it, but don't give it, uh, don't give it a ton of airspace in your head. Just get the job done and follow your dream. Yeah, I would, I would, I would agree with what Donna said. Like for me, it's, it's your attitude that you choose your, your thoughts and what you're going to listen to. And, and you are in control of, of your pathway forward. And I will never forget. Um, I was in a job when I got pregnant and told my boss and he was extremely upset with me and, you know, was, had a very negative reaction and it was all about attitude. And I said, well, I'm sorry, we tried to get Glenn pregnant, but it didn't work. And it was like, <laughs> I said that and he went, oh my God, like what, what, did, like, what have I done? He was obviously thinking of like the disruption rather than that this is a part of life. And I think that that helped reframe the way he was thinking as well, that this is just part of it. And this is part of my journey and everything is going to be fine. And we're going to continue on this trajectory. And um, so it's the attitude you have and you open doors, you do not close them and you lift people up rather than push them down. Absolutely. Janine, do you have anything to add? Those were two brilliant answers. So Janine, if you have nothing to add, then that's totally fine too. But I just think uh, winning a medal at the Olympics, people will listen to you a little <laughs> bit more than the person off the street sometimes. And so I think I was just in a really privileged uh, position because of that, which obviously took a lot of hard work and effort and all of the things. Um, it's but, uh, yeah, yeah, I got the street cred a little bit, but I have been super fortunate and again, don't see it quite like that, but I guess, yeah, that's what I'm doing and I like it and I'll keep going. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay, this is another audience question. Um, 
so the intro says for this session, no one should be excluded from the lifelong benefits of sport and far too often women and girls are left out of the picture. Whether you are new to sports or a long time participant, you and all women belong in sports. The question is, how is that asserted to uplift trans women athletes as well? Uh, Janine, would you like to uh, take that? I mean, put your coaching hat on. Yeah, yeah. So um, I have worked with trans athletes. Um, I've been fortunate to have that opportunity. Uh, I think things are changing. I know, like from rowing specific, both at the provincial level and at the national level, um, there are policies in place that allow trans women to race with the women or or men. I guess it goes both ways, right? Um, trans athletes in general can, or athletes can race of the gender of their choice. Um, and so for rowing, that's a thing. Um, if you think of Canada games in 2017, when it was met in Manitoba, there was a huge change going into the 2022 Canada games this past summer. I coached at both of them and saw um, a lot of positive change to allow for trans athletes to be at those games and, and accommodations made if, and when necessary or not the, um, and then even at the Olympics, at the 2012 Olympics, there was a weightlifter out of New Zealand who also a trans woman who was in the weightlifting category as well. So I think change doesn't happen overnight. It takes time, especially at the policy level. Um, but I think just knowing that they're welcome and, and things are working in that direction, I think it's a positive direction that we're going. But um yeah, I think I've seen a positive change in that and hope it continues. Yeah. So I think that's a good place to be. Yeah, and I, I love that you say Canada Games. They're they're I'm a big fan, leading the way and and something to be celebrated. Um what do you say to kids to encourage them to stay in sport and to keep involved in sport? I, I'll admit, when I was 15 years old, I quit speed skating. I got a job at Shoppers Drug Mart. I was a cashier. I loved this job. But my parents just were like pulling their hair out because they were thinking, oh my gosh, you can't quit. So what do you say to kids if they're kind of teetering, right? Or or women, sorry, I shouldn't even say kids. Let's Let's say whatever age. What would you say to them to encourage them to compete, to keep competing in sport or have a life after competition in sport. Donna? Well, so I'll, I'll, I'll answer. I have small kids. Well, not small. They're 10 and 12 now. But I think for, there's this quote, and I don't know who said it. It wasn't me, but someone said, like when you're talking to kids about playing and you're, you know, after you've watched them, just say, you know, I'm so excited to watch you play. I'm so excited to do. And, and it's crazy when you use that, like how they're like, oh, cool. Okay. And it, it just comes about that becomes about enjoying the experience together about watching them do something they like and watching them to be physically active and removing any of the outcome pieces that we often associate with sport participation from that conversation. So that like on the kids side, I've just found that to be really powerful with little guys. Um, but with, um, with, with women who are older or athletes who are exiting sport, I think thinking about the benefits of, I mean, and, and this isn't a new message, but like, keeping your body active and being able to move and sometimes for for moms right like for moms and females who are active like that's a super powerful message for younger women and younger girls to see is when they see women being active and sometimes that can help that role modeling can be really really powerful and it doesn't have to be at a highly competitive level just you know i'm not talking about masters athletics or high performers it's just playing on a rec ring at league or in a soccer league or just that I like to move and I, my body can move and and we need all types of bodies being active to demonstrate what healthy bodies look like right because oftentimes um there's a we all should look like one way and healthy bodies yoga bodies are all bodies right and so the more that we can role model uh people being active in healthy ways and engaging in active uh, active lifestyles, whether that's in competitive sport or whether that's in recreation sport or whether that's just going for a run on a Sunday afternoon, all of those uh, are powerful. So there's a ripple effect, I think, and we often don't think about it, but it's not just about us or just about our kids. It's about what does the community see us doing? And I think all of us have a role to play in keeping people active by showing what's possible just by being active, healthy humans. Yeah. Lisa and Janine. 
Anastasia, my youngest son just stopped speed skating and I was like, oh no. No, <laughs> give him my email. I'll talk about it a bit. Or <laughs> But you know what? Um, they both both of my boys are are very active in sport, and one is going off to college to do sport. and And for me, it's I'm I, t- I talk about the social aspects, the healthy aspects that this is a lifestyle, and um, if it's your passion, then you should follow it. Um, but but yeah, it's um, <laughs> it's a hard thing when you sometimes you may want it, you have to keep yourself in check um, more than the kids. But but. To me, it's it's the confidence that comes from sports that uh, makes awesome, awesome adults. Janine, do you want to have the final word? Yeah, I just think that if you can keep them in there and they're spending their time doing sports, especially in those teenage years, when the alternatives can take them down some wrong paths, if you can keep them in sport with friends who are also athletes with them, um, I think it can really change the outcome of of life and where they end up and what they're doing and so I think that's I think they're better off in sport than a lot of other places once uh, actually talking about mentors backing up uh, I um I had an old uh, teammate and, and friend who said you know when all is said and done medals and trophies are wonderful but um it's really the values that are the gift that sport mm-hmm. gives us and uh, again, sport has been the gift that's kept giving in my life. And I just feel very uh, privileged to have this conversation this evening. So thank you so much to Donna, Jean, and Lisa. If you couldn't tell that they're friends, I, I mean, <laughs> the energy was just superb. Uh, it, it's been a real pleasure these past 60 minutes. I want to say a big thank you to everyone for joining us tonight um, for this session of the Bison Transport Sport Leadership Series. We hope you enjoyed tonight's session and took away some valuable information from our guests. Mentorship. Try and find a mentor or be a mentee. Or excuse me, be a mentor. Find a mentee. That goes both ways. Take risks. You learn more from your failures than you ever will your successes. Um, support other women. Please, please, please. Jet fuel versus kryptonite. I love that. You got to run towards your uh, jet fuel. Jet fuel. And um, yeah, just thank you again so much for this lovely conversation. Thank you to our speakers, uh, all three of you for sharing all your stories and being vulnerable. And a huge, huge thank you to our title sponsor, Bison Transport. The series would not be possible without Bison Transport. So thank you. Tonight's session will be available on demand on Sport Manitoba's YouTube channel or at sportmanitoba.ca slash lead her ship. It's not leadership, it's lead her ship. Uh, We hope you'll join us again on Sunday, February 12th. Put that in your calendar, please. That is our fourth and final session of the Bison Transport Sport Leadership Series. And uh, details will be coming soon, so check your email. Thanks again and have a fantastic evening.